lecture. Uh, Professor, Professor I, I think the website only, uh, you uploaded the, the, the wrong link. So the link to slides for this lecture is still the link for the last lecture. The slides to the link to the slides to this lecture is still the link to the previous lecture. Uh, yes, the uh, link says lecture nine is here and one. It might say lecture nine, the slide, the file name may be off, but what about the contents? Take a look because well, I check uh, the same. it says scanning for patterns. Oh, so that's a mistake because I sent the slides out to the TAST as yesterday. So uh, since nobody mentioned it on Piazza, I didn't get a chance to check. We'll fix that as soon as the class is over. Okay. Uh, Thank thanks you. for letting me know. Now, so let's begin with today's uh, lecture. We're going to continue with our series on convolutional neural networks. In the last class, we saw the rationale behind the model. Today, we will revisit it first from a historical perspective and then go through the mechanics of the model. I'm going to begin today's lecture with a story and that's a story about cats. Now, CNN started off as models for vision. People have been curious about how vision works for, for the longest time. How does the brain interpret and recognize the images that form in your eye? Now, most early research focused on behavioral responses. How do we respond to, how do we respond behaviorally, behaviorally to visual patterns? So typically these studies focused on illusions and phenomena like gestalt, for example, over here. How many of you see a cube in this figure? Anybody see the cube here? Yeah. And what's this? A dog. And this one? And, uh... and, and this is a ball with spikes. And yet none of these figures actually has these patterns. This figure is just a bunch of Pac-Man uh, figures. This is a bunch of black patches. This is a bunch of black patches. There is no sphere in this figure. You only have the cones. Your brain filled the remaining information to create impressions of objects that were not really there in the figure. So this kind of behavioral analysis was what uh, much of the early studies on the studies on vision focused on. But such behavioral studies don't really get to how the brain actually forms these interpretations. And so the first significant work on understanding the biology behind vision was this work by Hubel and Wiesel in 1959, where they studied the neural correlates of vision. They studied the striat cortex of cats. Now the striat cortex is the equivalent of the V1 region of the human brain, which is here at the back of the head and connects directly to the eye. The human eye is a really, really, really poor design. So your ret the retina, for instance, the nerves that carry the information about the, about the image are placed in front of the light sensing cells of the retina. So they actually have to go bend back and make a hole through the retina and to get to the brains, which is why we have a blind spot in our vision. That's the point where the nerves fold back and punch a hole. Through, your, um, through the light sensors. And then instead of directly connecting to something nearby, that optic uh, nerve goes all the way and connects to something in the back. This is the V1, V1 uh, portion of your brain, which analyzes, first analyzes images. And in cats, the equivalent uh, portion of the brain is the striate cortex. And it's called the striate cortex because the cells are striated in shape. And in their experiments, Hubel and Wiesel experimented with 24 cats. The cats were anesthetized, they were immobilized, and they were with truth serum, and they were put on artificial respirators. And electrodes were stuck into their brain to take readings. They don't tell us if they killed the cats, but they do mention that they took brain tissue for studies later, so you can imagine what happened. But then uh, here's the experiment. In the experiment, they held the anesthetized cat's irises open and beamed light of different wavelengths through onto, through it onto the retina. 
Now they beam light, light of different patterns, lines, dots, etc., and then they measure the cortical neural responses. Each neuron and the cortex was found to respond to a localized region of the retina. So uh, this is the region of the uh, of your visual field that the neuron specifically responds to, and this was what they call the receptive field of the neuron. So although your eye may sense all of this image, the neuron in particular only responds to uh, the image in this region, which, which is its receptive field. Within this area, you have excitatory regions and inhibitory regions. When light falls on the excitatory region, the neuron fires. If light falls on the inhibitory region, it suppresses neuron firing. So here's what they found. Neurons didn't respond to diffuse light over the, uh, uh, over the receptive field. That's because the uh, inhibitory regions canceled out the excitatory regions. For a neuron to fire, light must, must fall on the excitatory region. And at the same time, it must not fall on the inhibitory region. And the neuron responds if the light follows this pattern. So by moving a spot of light around, and finding which directions of motion resulted in the greatest response, they could find the structure of the receptive field. And they found receptive fields are generally linear patterns, which could be say horizontal or vertical or, or at an angle. Now, in all of these figures, the blue lines, the, the blue regions are the excitatory regions, the red regions are the inhibitory regions, and you can see that these uh, the receptive fields are all, are all generally oriented lines. These pictures are for mice and for monkeys, but for humans, but, but for cats, they're also very similar. And I assume also for humans. So here is one of their results. In each figure, the bar to the left shows the orientation of the light that is shown on the eye. The longer bar with the ticks shows the neural response. The more ticks, the greater the response. For this particular neuron, you will see that when the orientation of the light is horizontal, there is no response at all. Then as you rotate the light, by the time the, the, the light becomes vertical, you get a lot of response. So clearly, the receptive field of this particular neuron is a vertical stripe. And so, uh, they found that oriented slits of light were the most effective stimuli for activating striate cortex neurons. They ran more experiments and reported in 1962 that there are in fact two levels of processing in detecting these patterns. And these are performed by two different types of neurons. The first level uh, is performed by what they call simple cells or S cells. The second level was performed by what they call complex cells or C cells. Now both S cells and C cells responded to the same kind types of patterns, but the response of the S cell was more noisy and the job of the C cell was to clean up the response of the S cell. So they came up with this model. The first level of sensing is by the retina. Each cell in the retina has a circular receptive field. Now the S cells connect to linear arrangements of retinal cells. So if the light falls along this line, the S cell fires. But then the retinal cells, and as a result, the S cells are sensitive to noise. So the C cells connect to groups of S cells and only respond to the S cell with the largest output, the, the strongest output. So this makes the response of the C cell more robust to noise. And so the complex C cells, C cell responses build up from similar, similarly oriented uh, simple or S cells, and they fine tune the response of the S cells. The entire visual system has a complex buildup the early layers detect simple patterns. The deeper layers, which build on the patterns of the earlier layer, recognize increasingly complex patterns. So as the signals are passed through the system, 
the overall response gets increasingly more complex. Later on, uh, Hubel and Wiesel uh, continued with more experiments on waking macaque monkeys, and those, exper I mean, those experiments are quite evil and would probably not pass, pass muster with animal rights uh, folks these days. So we won't talk about them, but this is the kind of animal they worked on later. And of course, adding insult to the injury to the poor cats that they ran the experiment on, they later concluded that their model was perhaps not quite right. Anyway, uh, I poll. We'll have a poll. Yes. Ten seconds, guys. Okay. So this is right, right? S cells find patterns and the C cells clean them up. This is what they found. And, and so matters stayed in the domain of brain studies until Fast forward to 1980, and Kunohiko Fukushima computationalized, computationalized Hubel and Wiesel's model. And in doing this, he also addressed one of the key deficiencies in their model, that of position invariance. Now, has anyone here heard of the Jennifer Aniston neuron? Anyone? Yeah, the one that fires on scene in France, right? Yeah. So apparently some of us have neurons that only fire when we see Jennifer Aniston. And how did they find this? Epilepsy patients sometimes undergo brain surgery to treat the lesions in the brain. For this, they, are, the, they just lie in hospitals for several days with their skull partially opened and the brain exposed. So of course, researchers use this as an opportunity to run brain studies. So they play a, place a mesh of sensors on the brain and then present the patients with the various stimuli, like showing them pictures, and then record the responses of the brain. And one of these experiments they found in the early 2000s, they found that one of their patients had a neuron that only fired when he was shown pictures of Jennifer Aniston. Now, it turns out it's not just Jennifer Aniston. The actual person is not the key point here. The key point here is that we, we all have neurons that fire only when we see very specific people. So for instance, we have a grandmother cell, which fires only whenever we see a grandma. But here's what is important. It doesn't matter where in your field of vision she is, whether she's to the right or whether she's to the left or whether she's to the center. The firing is position invariant. And so this idea was not immediately present in Hubel and Wiesel's model. Fukushima incorporated this kind of positional invariance into this model. Fukushima's model was called the neocognitron. In his model, the visual stimulus consisted of, consisted of a hierarchy of modules. Each module has two layers, a layer of S cells followed by a layer of C cells. The S layer corresponds to Hubel and Wiesel's simple cells. The C layer corresponds to their complex cells. So here is the model and their figure. U0 comes from the retina. This is the input itself, the image. This image is first processed by the S layer in the first block. The C layer operates on the output of the S layer. In subsequent blocks, the S layer operates on the output of the C layer in the previous block. And the C layer operates on the output of the S layer. So each block is a pair with an S layer followed by a C layer. And, and the first layer in each block is the S layer, which operates on the C, the C layer of the previous block. Of these blocks, only the S cells are plastic, meaning only the S cells can learn the responses. The responses of the C cells is fixed and not learned. 
their only job is to confirm the S cell responses. So now, what do each of these blocks look like? Within each block, the S cells are arranged and uh, organized in rectangular groups called S planes, as shown in this figure. Within each S plane, all the cells have identical responses. Each cell over here looks at a slightly different region of their input than the other cells in the plane, but they all have identical responses. The C cells are also organized into rectangular groups called C planes, and you have one C plane per S plane. So all the C cells also have fixed identical responses, except that adjacent C cells look at somewhat non-overlapping regions. So the C cells are C planes are somewhat smaller than their corresponding S planes. In uh, Fukushima's original work, each C and S and C cell looks at an elliptical region in the previous plane. So here's a full depiction of the model. At the input, U0 is the retina. Now each cell and each of the S planes in the first layer looks at an elliptical region of the input to compute its response. Each cell of the first C plane of each first uh, for C plane in the first layer computes its response from an elliptical region of the corresponding S plane. Now in subsequent layers, each S plane cell looks simultaneously at identical elliptical regions of all of the C planes in the previous layer. And uh, then the C plane of that layer, within the C plane of that layer, each cell looks at a small elliptical region, but only within the corresponding S plane. Now, again, the key point here is that all the cells in the S plane have identical responses. Their responses are learnable. The S cell responses are computed jointly from all the C planes of the previous layer. The C planes are smaller than the corresponding S cells and a C plane computes its response only from its corresponding S plane. And because the C planes are smaller than the S planes, as the uh, information goes through the network, these maps shrink. Why does this, what's going on here? Sorry. So now the neocognitron model also has formulae for the activation of the S and C planes. The formulae are kind of complicated, but if you look at them closely, the S cell responses look like ReLUs applied to a weighted combination of the inputs. And so the uh, S plane responses have these parameters, these weights, which are learnable. The response of a C plane looks like a max filter, which basically selects simply, simply selects the max of all of its inputs. And so only the S cells have parameters that can be learned. The C cell responses have no parameters. And so as we go through the net, two things happen. First, the cell planes keep getting smaller with the layers. Secondly, if you consider the receptive field of any cell, which is the region of the input that it responds to, the receptive fields get larger as you go through the network. So this, one, this cell only responds to this ellipse. This cell responds to this ellipse of, uh, uh, of values from this plane. And since each of these points itself looks at an ellipse out here, this ellipse represents a much bigger region in the input. And so the receptive uh, field of this cell is larger. And keep, as you keep going through the network, the receptive fields keep getting larger and larger. So this means that the deeper cells capture larger and more complex patterns than the earlier cells. Also, as we go through the network, the number of planes increases in Fukushima's model. And this is intuitively right. 
because we can have many more complex patterns than simple ones. So when you're detecting complex patterns, you need a larger number of detectors than when you are detecting simple patterns. Now, Fukushima's model uses unsupervised learning. We provide the uh, network with inputs, like pictures of characters, letters, whatever, and update the parameters according to a learning rule. There is no label, so you don't assign a, the inputs don't come with assigned labels. Now, in the learning, the S plane parameters are for each plane are randomly initialized. And then they'll learn through Hebbian learning. Now, you'll remember the Hebbian rule the weight of any connection is updated by the product of the input and the output. But then there's a twist. So if you look at all of the planes, S planes, in any particular layer, if you look at any particular value in the input, this value gets a response from every one of the S planes because this value is being read by this first plane, by the second plane, by the third plane, by pretty much every plane in this layer. We will select only the, 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 the plane where that has the strongest response to that particular input. So when you compute this uh, uh, heavy and learning rule, uh, we, we are only going to update the parameters of the neuron that had the strongest response at any particular position to an input. So uh, there's one, there's, here's a different way of looking at it. You can visualize that as stacking all of these S-planes into this cuboidal structure. And then at each position, you pick the plane which has the highest value. And then you're going to update the weight for that value, or for that, the, uh, uh, the weight that links the input and uh, the output for just that plane. But then when you update the weight for, the, for, the, for that cell in the plane, because all the cells in the plane are supposed to be identical, you will also update the parameters of all the other cells within the same plane. So for every input, you're picking one plane and then you're updating all the parameters within the plane. And simply because of the random nature of the algorithm, different input points will get assigned to different planes and update the parameters of the neurons in that plane. So this learning algorithm ensures that different planes learn different features of the inputs. And these features get more complex as we go through the layers. So for example, given many examples of the character A, early layers may learn patterns like these bars. Subsequent layers will learn more complex structures. And then finally, when you get to the large, the, 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 deepest layers, one particular S plane may learn to detect the character A. So the net effectively learns to perform clustering with this winner take all uh, call, making the entire strategy sort of focus towards learning to cluster the inputs. Now, Fukushima ran various experiments and showed the model that the model successfully learns to cluster semantic visual concepts like digits or characters. So for example, when it's trained on examples of digits like these, the final layer response becomes quite specific. Some cells fire only in response to zeros, response to one and so on. Also, the behavior is robust to noise. So it's, it's scaling, and position invariant and also doesn't get affected by noise. And so the bottom line is that the neocognitron is able to learn visual concepts without supervision. So at this point, we have a second poll. In the poll thoughts? Uh I think we have to relaunch it. Okay.
So 10 seconds, guys. All right, let me stop the call. Both of these statements are true. Although I haven't explained how supervision can be added, added to Fukushima's model. That's what we're going to look at next. So the neocognitron is fully unsupervised. The semantic labels it learns are automatically derived. So the question that naturally arises is, is can we add external supervision to the model and force it to learn specific concepts? And there were several proposals like Homa and Atlas and Marx and 88 who suggested a model for imposing temporal correlations. Kevin Lang and his team at CMU did it for speech signals and came up with the time delay neural networks. And Jan Lekun came up with a model for images, the convolutional neural network. So we're going to look at the story through the perspective of Lekun's model. In general, the way we add supervision is to add an extra decision layer after the final C layer. And this decision layer will produce a class label. Now we have a fully feed forward MLP with shared parameters. All the S cells within NIS plane have the same weights, so they share parameters. And now, because you're producing a class label, you can have a ground truth label and simple back propagation rules can be used to train the SL weights for every plane in every layer. Now, uh, again, note that the original neocognitron as, uh, as Fukushima, Fukushima had it, actually has entire S planes with many, 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 many copies of a single neuron. So all of them are identical. Uh, now, in uh, each of these had an elliptical receptor field. Now in Lekun's model, the elliptical receptor field was changed to a square receptor field. So the S-plane neurons have a KL cross KL receptor field where the size of the receptor field is dependent on the layer. And the C-plane neurons also have a receptive field which is square and again the size of the receptive field may change with the layer and here is the uh, operation of the s neurons now each s plane neuron computes a weighted sum of or consider this one it computes a weighted sum of a square regions from all of the pre previous layer C planes and then computes an activation on it. Now in the C planes, each C cell picks the max value from a square region of just the corresponding S plane. And now because all of the neurons in an S plane are identical, you can either have many explicit copies of a neuron or you can simply think of this as a single neuron sort of scanning the C plane of the previous layer. So you can replace having multiple explicit copies with a convolution operation. And this is exactly what uh, is done in Lekun's model, which is LayNet. Now the operation of uh, scanning the input is basically the same as convolving the input with a filter that is composed of the weights of the neuron. So this is a convolution and we call these neurons filters and we call the entire network a convolutional neural network. So the individual neurons are now effectively filters which convolve the output of the previous layer. Now that's just terminology, but then the point is you just have a neuron which is scanning the outputs of the previous layer. And so uh, here is the video of Lekun's demo for LayNet, which was his CNN model, which was used to recognize handwritten digits. Now, the corpus that this was run on is the MNIST corpus. But back in the 80s and 90s, recognizing handwritten digits was a real problem for the US Postal Service. And so I believe LayNet's model, uh, LayNet was uh, targeted to their problem. And as you can see from the video here, 
as the digits come by, the network does a really good job of recognizing them. And this is back in the early 90s, 30 years ago. And so here's the story so far. The mammalian visual cortex consists of S cells, which capture oriented visual patterns, and C cells, which perform a majority vote over groups of S cells for robustness to noise in positional jitter. The neocognitron emulates this behavior with planar banks of S and C cells with identical response to enable shift invariance. Only the C cells are learned, uh, the S cells are learned. The uh, C cells perform the equivalent of a max over groups of S cells for robustness. Unsupervised learning results in learning useful patterns, but Lecun's LeNet added external supervision uh, to the neocognitron, where S planes of cells with identical responses are modeled by a scan or a convolution by a single neuron, and C planes are emulated by cells that perform a max over a group of S cells, and this gives us a convolutional neural network. Structurally, a convolutional neural network comprises convolutional and downsampling layers. Convolutional layers are scanning layers composed of neurons that scan their inputs for patterns. These corresponding correspond to the S planes in the Fukushima model. Downsampling layers are layers which perform max operations over groups of outputs from the corresponding convol convolutional layers. And in the process, they also reduce the size of the maps. Now, typically the S and C planes alternate, but this is not necessary. You can have several convolutional layers in a row, in a row before a downsampling layer like here. And then finally, after all of these convolutional and downsampling layers, uh, you can we have an MLP with one or more layers, which produces an output. So the uh, uh, general, yeah, what happened here? We're having trouble. Okay. So the convolution layers and the MLP are all learnable. Their parameters must be learned from training data for the target classification task. And these downsampling layers, they are fixed and they are generally not learnable. Now, a convolution layer consists of a series of maps, which, as I mentioned, correspond to S planes in the neocognitron. We'll generally call these feature maps or activation maps. Now, each activation map over here, in turn, has two components. The first is an affine map, which is obtained simply by convolving a filter which as I mentioned is simply a set of weights for a neuron with the outputs of the previous layer. And then once we get the activation map, we apply an activation on the, when once we get an affine map, we apply an activation on the entries of the affine map to get the final output of the layer. And Anudip, yes, C cell is a max pool operation. That's exactly where the max pool operation came from. So now again, each of these affine planes is computed through a joint convolution over all of the planes in the previous layer. Now to see how, consider the contribution of just one map, which is shown in this highlighted point. So let's say I'm trying to compute this one map in any plane and uh, well, so why do we take the max pool? This originally was from, is entirely motivated by Hubel and Wiesel's model. And so these are C planes. The entire model motivation at this point is biological. But if you want to see why exactly, you'll have to see, uh, see uh, the video for Monday's lecture, which should go up shortly. It will be there in the last 20 minutes. Anyway, out here, consider this, S plane map, which is being computed from all of these maps of the previous layer. Now let's just see how this one guy contributes to this map, right? 
So I'll use this example. This green picture over here represents this map. And this uh, grid represents a filter with which we will scan this map. The filter is looking at a three cross three uh, window of the input. Recall that the filter is just the set of weights of the scanning neuron. Now the filter also has a bias. Here I'm going to assume that it's zero. So now the filter is placed on top. Uh, if, you know, this is a three cross three filter. We place it at the left hand top corner as shown in this figure. So here the bold numbers are the numbers of the original man. The little numbers below are the filter values. Now we compute a component wise product of all of these guys and add them up. And if you add them up, you'll find that the sum is one times one plus one times zero plus one times one plus zero plus one plus zero plus zero plus zero plus one. So one, two, three, four. That value four is going to be entered in the top left corner of the, uh, of the computed affine map. So this is the input map from the previous layer. This is the filter. And you convolve this input map with this filter and you're computing this affine map. This is what you computed with every top left position. And then this filter sort of scans the input like so and performs this same operation at each point, which is the uh, sum of the component wise products to compute the number over here. Now, because in this example, the uh, filter always step forward one step at a time. The filter need not advance one position at a time. You can actually have uh, advanced it by more than one position. So this is what we will call a stride. You can have a larger, larger stride, so two. For example, here, if I use a stride of two, you have a stride of two going forwards and also a stride of two going down. So the output is only going to be two cross two, which is smaller than when you had a stride of one. Now, the animation that I showed just showed you how one plane over here of the, from the previous layer contributes to any plane in the current layer. But in reality, if this is the pre this previous layer, this is the previous layer. So the, this, this figure here represents the, the layer with the orange rectangles. Uh, in reality, to compute an output map, you're going to simultaneously convolve over all of these guys. And so uh, you would have, if you were convolving it with a three cross three filter, you would have several three sets of three cross three uh, arrangements of weights, one per uh, uh, plane from the previous layer. So here you have several uh, planes in the previous layer you would have one of these three cross three filter blocks for every one of these planes. And then to compute the top left corner of the output map, you're going to put, you're going to, come on, place this entire filter out here on the top left corner, and then compute, the, compute a component wise product of all of these values. So, you have nine, comp nine values coming from here, nine from here, nine from here, and from the remaining planes. And then you sum them all up to get this uh, single value out here. And so uh, this is the actual computation that's performed. Here we have a three cross three filter. So for each filter, we, the filter itself is represented by these weights. This one here uh, means that you're computing the first output map. You, you compute a component wise product of the filter weights and the underlying map, which are represented by I. You do this over the entire three cross three region for each one of these maps. And then you sum over all of the maps to get this one value. And so now you can perform this entire scan like so. And this is the actual computation that's going to give you this output map. Now, this gives you only one output map. To compute a second output map in the next layer, 
we will need a second filter and which is different from our first filter. And the second filter is going to be scanning the input to compute the second map. Now, is this making sense to everybody? Questions? Um, I do have a question. So it looks yeah. like uh, based on the, the drawing, the, the, the future for the future two, uh, the second filter is different for each uh, at, at each position, right? Because it, right. So 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 basically, if you look at the filter over here, these the this three cross three pattern is going to be different for every one of these planes. This collection represents the filter that computes this first one. The second okay, filter. The second filter is a completely different filter. It computes the second plane, right? Indeed, each filter learns different features, right? The filter effectively represents a neuron which scans the input, right? So a different way to visualize this is to stack the maps one behind the other into a cube. So you have all of these maps, which are these orange guys, instead of arranging them one on top of the other like so, I can arrange them one behind the other like so, and now it becomes a cuboidal structure. And now similarly, this filter, which is uh, a, a collection of these three cross three planes, I can stack them also into this cuboidal structure. So they have basically taken the collection of planes and arranged them as a cube. This is the output of the previous layer. This is my filter and each filter also has a bias. And so now to compute the output affine map, I place this cuboidal filter at the top left corner and then perform a component wise multiplication and add all the terms up. So here, this innermost term over here is performing a component wise multiplication of this first plane of the filter with the corresponding region of the first map. And then the summation is summing similar components, similar values computed from each of these planes. And so when you sum all of them up plus this bias, you're going to get this one value out here. So is this making sense guys, this visualization? So basically all the planes are the same right here. The, the planes, planes are not the same, right? These planes are uh, these planes are these guys, the output maps of the previous layer, which can all be different, right? So in the keyword, you are saying um, the flat the flat thing is different for each layer. Exactly. So no, this this whole thing is one layer. Remember that cuboid is this one. This is one layer, right? And in one layer, you had several S planes, right? And so instead of having them one on top of the other, I just rearrange them as a cuboid. It's just visualization. Yeah, but the filter remains the same for like, let's say we are calculating for the first neuron. So the filter is this guy. Again, these have been arranging one behind one behind the other. So all the values are going to be different throughout this cuboid. Okay, now I see. Now I see. Did, did I answer your question? Okay, and so now to compute the output map, all I have to do is perform the same computation at each position and I can compute the entire output map. Now a single filter is a single cuboid and it will produce a single output map. We're going to need one such filter for each output map. So each layer of the network will actually include a uh, a collection of such cuboidal filters. Now, the outcome of the convolution is an affine map. The size of this output depends on many factors, including the size of the input maps, the size of the filter, and the stride of the convolution. So the output map may not be the same size as the input. And then there are edge effects which become important. So what are these edge effects? Let's take a look. Consider this example. The input here is five by five. 
the filter size is three cross three. The stride is one, right? How many steps can the filter take before it falls off the edge? Before it sort of leaks out of the edge? Anyone? Just three, right? Which is why the output is three cross three. Now, uh, so in general, suppose I had a stride of two, then I can take no more than two steps before the filter goes off the edge, right? So the size of the output is not the same as the size of the input. How does the size of the output relate to the size of the input? So for this, we can come up with a generic formula. If I can pull up my whiteboard. Right. So if I've got, say, an input, my, my laptop is really responding very slowly. I'm not sure why. This is something is broken with my laptop. Okay. I don't think I can draw on this machine today because, oh my good God. Can you folks see anything? Yeah, we can see a, uh, a box, half drawn box. Well, no, my screen is blank. So I'm going to have to kill this. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, we can come up with a general size for the output map. I apologize for not being able to draw. Something is wrong with my laptop. But in general, if I have a input of size n cross n and my filter is m cross m suppose i place the filter in this corner over here then so if i place the filter yeah how many steps can i take before the filter goes off the edge anyone n minus m, n minus m. It's going to be n minus m plus one because when I take yes, I take yes, but then I also have the original original placement, right? So I have I place the original filter here, and then there are m min, n minus m positions left. So I can the total output size is going to be n minus m plus one on each side. And uh, if I have a stride of size s then I can take n minus m over s stripes steps plus the original position. So in that case, the output is going to be n minus m over s plus one on each side. And so taking, if the stride is greater than one, this is going to cause the output map to be smaller than the input map. And uh, even if the stride is one, the output map is still going to be smaller than the input map because uh, there, you know, after a certain number of steps, you, you cannot go beyond the input. So if you have a filter of size m cross m, the output is going to be lesser than the input by m minus one columns and, and m minus one rows. Now, in many situations, this reduction in size is something that's not acceptable. And so the solution and these situations, you know, so when you have a so, so the so the solution in these situations is to sort of zero pad your input such so that you don't get this reduction in size. What we will do is to add zeros all around the input at the boundary, and we will do this as symmetrically as possible. So that in total, we add m minus one columns and m minus one rows to the original input. And now we are going to scan this zero padded input using your m cross m filter. And this ensures that with a stride of one, the output size is the same as your original input before the zero padding. So is that clear to everybody? Guys? Yes. Okay. So 
the outcome of this convolution is going to be this appointment. To get the actual output of the layer, we then apply an activation to every element in the affine map to get the output layer. So here it is in pseudocode form. For each layer of the network, we scan the outputs of the previous layer. The highlighted ship, so this highlighted uh, portion shows you the computation for a single layer. And first we compute the affine maps at each position, we pull out a block, the, the cuboidal uh, region that I just showed, the affine uh, function of this block, and then apply an activation to it. We're going to get one such output map per filter in the, uh, in the layer. Now, the second component of the CNN it is a downsampling layer, which occurs between convolutional, uh, convolutional layers and shrinks the maps. The downsampling layer is generally combined with pooling. Remember, pooling does not imply downsampling. Downsampling simply means that the size of the map is reduced. But generally, when we perform pooling, we will downsample. So when we speak of downsampling layers, often it just refers to pooling layers. So, and the most common pooling, of course, is max pooling because this is the analog of Fukushima C map. Remember that the original motivation for the whole thing was the was biological. It came off uh, the Hubel and Wiesel, Wiesel uh, model, right? So here's how we perform max pooling. At each position, our max pooling is going to also have a little uh, window, a filter that it looks at. And at each position, you're going to select the largest element of the square pool at that element and replace the value with this max. So if these four values here are three, one, four, and six, the corresponding output is going to be six. You slide forward. And if these four values are one, six, three, and five, the largest is six. So the corresponding value is going to be six. And then these would be, you know, three, five, two, seven, the largest value is seven. So the output here is seven. We can put, continue to perform this operation and scan the entire input. Now the simple max pooling operation doesn't actually give you downsampling. Uh, the, uh, it, it doesn't have to be. These are independent operations. So uh, now simple max pooling won't give you downsampling. To downsample, you're going to require a stride greater than one, like so. And this is actually going to give you an output that is actually smaller than the input by some factor. In other words, the output is downsampled. So uh, here's the kind of pseudocode for max pooling. Now there's a difference between uh, the between uh, the uh, pooling layers and standard convolution layers. A convolution layer, in order to compute any value, you simultaneously look at all of the maps in the previous layer. In a pooling layer. Uh, for every, you, you for each map, you perform this independently on each map. And for each map, you only con consider the corresponding map from the previous layer. So pooling doesn't pool across maps. It only pools within a map. I want to explain, explain this pseudocode in greater detail, but take a look at it because it's, it, it, it is fairly self-explanatory. Self now, in general, if you downsample an n cross n picture or image with a p cross p pooling filter with some stripe d, then the output size is going to be n minus p over d plus one. So in this example, this four cross four input with two cross two max pooling with a stride of two is going to give you a two cross two output, but the value is shown. And the four colors on the image to the right show you, tell you which of the windows on the, on the left, they were computed from. Generally, when you're performing pooling with downsampling, usually zero value. What happened? 
Did we forget to record? So I think so. I, I've never heard the uh, recording stopped. I guess it's a glitch. So I'm going to have to redo that portion right later. When I, I thought I had turned it on. No, I mean, no, I mean, it, it, it's probably on. I, I, I never heard the recording stopped. So it's okay. probably still on. It's just a glitch. Hopefully. All right. So, all right, uh, Jerry, what was your question? Oh, sorry. I was glitched out. I, I didn't mean to raise my hand. <laughs> okay, that's okay. All right. So, now you don't always have to perform a max pooling. You can also perform mean pooling, where you compute the mean of the values in the window. Uh, again, so pseudo code for mean pooling. The max operation is just replaced by the mean. Instead of the mean, you can also you have other kinds of p norms. So this is neither the max nor the mean, but some p norm of the values in the pool, which is given by this formula here. It's the pth root of the average of the pth power of the values in the pool. So when p is one, uh, this is going to be the mean. When p is a very large number, this is going to be the max. And intermediate for the values of p, it's going to be somewhere something in between. Or, or instead of computing the max, mean, or p norm, you could even have a pooling network that uh, uh, we can we could even have a network that takes in all of these values and computes some output. And so this would be some something like a pooling network. Or you can dispense with the pooling altogether and never perform pooling and the downsampling is simply going to be a standard convolution with a stride greater than one. In fact, this is a common approach used these days. Most networks dispense with explicit pooling layers and just use uh, convolutions with strides greater than one to, to, to downsample. So this is the pseudocode we saw earlier. If the scanning is performed with a stride greater than one, but otherwise you're performing the usual convolution operations, then this is going to be a fully convolution network, meaning there are no down pooling operations. And the yellow region here shows the convolution layer. So uh, the story so far, the convolutional network is a supervised version of a computational model for mammalian vision. It includes convolution layers comprising learned filters that scan the output of the previous layer. We have downsampling by pooling layers that vote over groups of outputs from the convolution layer. Convolution can change the size of the output. This may be controlled via zero padding. Pooling layers may perform max, p norms, or be learned. And regular convolution with stride greater than one can also be uh, used to perform downsampling. So we have a poll over here. Uh, there is someone who's raised their hand, Jiaru. Oh, sorry, could you please um, raise my hand? I was like glitched on my part, so there's okay. like du duplicate on my account. Sorry. Okay. All right, so let me end the polling in five seconds. And so, yes, both of these statements are true. You cannot downsample if you have a stride of uh, one, because then this output size is not really being, your, your downsampling literally means that for any, every n inputs, you're getting some m outputs where n over m is some fixed ratio, right? You're reducing the size of the output, not considering edge effects. And if you have a stride of one, this is not going to happen. Yanjani, what's the question? 
Uh, yeah, no, I was just uh, wondering if there's um, some benefit uh, to um, max pooling over down sampling. Yes, so uh, there is a benefit and this is explained in lecture one. So again, take a look at the last 20 minutes. But the point of pooling is, if you, uh, is to introduce jitter invariance. Now consider that you're trying to detect a flower, right? So what happens as you go through the layers? The first layer detects when we, we have these distributed representations. So the first layer looks at small regions of the input and detects things like petals. The second layer sort of takes patterns of these petals or whatever else and creates larger objects and creates maybe a portion of a flower or a flower. Now, if a petal jitters by a little bit, a pixel or two pixels, does that mean that it's no longer a flower? What would you say? No. If any, it, it doesn't mean that, right? So you want to have some jitter invariance. So what kind of activation function is jitter invariant? You want an activation function that is somewhat permutation invariant, where you can jiggle the inputs around and the output doesn't change, right? Okay, hence max pooling. Max mean all of those have this jitter invariance property. But then they only make sense if the window over which they are looking, considering inputs is sufficiently small because jitter invariance over large windows basically makes the whole thing rubbish. Right? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought, thanks. Yeah. And of course, CNNs can perform regression. We have a couple of lectures left, right? Uh, it depends on the input, uh, on the, anyway. So let's try to put everything together for a typical image classification task. I'm going to assume max pooling for down sampling. This may run a couple of minutes over guys, just bear with me. So if we are processing images, the inputs might either be grayscale or a color image. A grayscale image will only be one matrix of pixel values for a color image. The image actually consists of three images, a red image, a green image, and a blue image. So what we see are the R, G, and B images displayed together. In order to be generic, I'm going to assume that the image is in color with RGB components. So uh, here is the input. It's actually a set of three images, which I will stack together into a cuboidal stack of color maps that is 3D. Our first layer is going to comprise a collection of filters of K1 filters in total. Each filter is going to have some L cross L phase, but because it operates on a stack of three images, the filter size is actually L cross L cross three where three is the depth. The number of filters will usually be a power of two, like two, four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera. Now, and the size of the face of the filter is uh, uh, generally five cross five, three cross three, or even one cross one. So what was the question, uh, Anadi? Uh, we do see issues in CNN where jitter or noise can throw off the predictions. There's only so much your model can do, right? And so introducing jitter invariance is going to come at the cost of performance if there's too much jitter invariance. So by the time you begin accounting for every kind of form of jitter, you basically lost performance. Uh, you have, there's, there's a very gentle trade-off or actually it's not even very gentle, right? So what is K1? K1 is the number of filters. It can be two, meaning I'd have only two filters or I can have four filters, right? So it's basically the number of output maps that I'm going to produce. And so these have to be small enough to capture fine features, particularly if I'm sort of scaling down images to process them. And what does it mean for this filter to be one cross one? The one cross one filter is basically the undistributed neuron that we first saw in the last lecture. We began by saying I'm scanning this image with, a, with an MLP, right? When we scanned, the, we scanned it with an MLP that did not have distributed representations, then after the first layer, subsequent layer neurons looked at only one element from each map. So 
This is simply a perceptron. This is a neuron that operates over the depth of the stack of maps, but has no spatial extent. It takes one pixel from each of the maps at each given location as, uh, as input. Now you should remember that uh, this is the sky kind of scanning neuron we first talked about when we spoke of scanning with an NLP without having distributed representations. Now, although I've been representing as this filter as five cross five or three cross three, the more appropriate representation is five cross five cross three, because this input is three deep or three cross three cross three or one cross one cross three, right? So uh, here are all the parameters you'd have to choose for the first layer of your network, which is the number of filters K1. And as I mentioned just now, K1 is generally taken to be a power of two. The size of the face, which will be small like one, three or five. And also the stride, how much are these filters uh, striding by? And now the total number of parameters, you have K1 filters, each filter is got three times L squared parameters and a bias. So the total number of parameters is K1 times three L squared plus one. Now, before we perform the actual convolution, you may zero pad the input according to the size of the filters to ensure that the size of the images is uh, retained for uh, after convolution. No. The different the filters are going to each plane of the filter can be different. If you want to have the same filter values across all planes, that's a design choice, but then you lose expressivity in your model when you do that. Now each filter convolves the input. And so you're going to get as many, and each filter is going to uh, produce one output map. So you're going to get as many output maps as filters. And here is the Op operation that a filter performs to compute its output. Nothing here, new here, you've seen it before. At each position, you place the filter at that position. It computes a, 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 a component-wise product of the filter value and the image plane at that position across the face of the filter. And then you sum across all, all the planes and that gives you an affine value you put that affine value through an activation and you get the output. So one filter is going to give you a single two dimensional output map, which, which has been computed in a two step process. First, you computed a two different two, two dimensional affine map, and then you applied an activation, typically a ReLU. Now, since one filter gives you one 2D map, if you have K1 filters, you're gonna get K1 two-dimensional maps. And so again, to reiterate, we have K1 filters, each of size L cross L cross three. So the total number of parameters is K1 times three L squared plus one. All of these parameters must be learned for the first layer. Following the first convolutional layer, you may have a downsampling by pooling layer in our example. So it's going to pool P cross P uh, blocks of the previous layer Y maps into a single value with a stride, some stride D. So here is the operation for max pooling. Y2 is the max pooled map. The subscript over here M shows which map is being pooled. So Y2M is saying that this is the a uh, pooled map for the mth from obtained from the mth map over here. And now to compute the ijth value in this pooled map, you're going to go forward by i minus one strides in the horizontal and horizontal direction, j minus one strides in the vertical direction to get to the current position. And from that position, you're going to look at a p cross p region and you pick the maximum value over there. So the parameters to choose over here are the size of this pooling block, P cross P, and the pooling stride. And you may also have to decide whether you're performing max pooling or mean pooling or learned pooling. Now, in practice, 
you're not simply going to compute the max directly like so. Instead, what you will do is you will do this in a two-step, two-stage process. You'll first find the index of the largest value, the index of the maximum value, and then copy the value at that index into the output. So the max pooling operation is performed in two stages. At each position within the block, you're going to find the index of the maximum value and copy the value at that index into the max pool block. You will need this when you're performing back, back propagation later. Now, uh, again, like the inputs, it's more convenient to stack these maps produced by the convolutional and max pooling layers and see them as a cuboidal stack of depth K2. So the first, oh, this K2 is going to be the same as K1 over there. So you had K1 maps over here. So this is going to be at depth K1. After max pooling, you're going to still have the same number of maps. So it's still going to be K1. And, uh, and then uh, I'm going to introduce a little more jargon here. These uh, convolutional filters are often called kernels. The output of the individual filters are called channels. So here, because we have K1 filters, the output has K1 channels. The pooling layer works on individual channels output by the convolution layer. So the pooling layer output has exactly as many channels as the previous layer. So K2 is going to equal K1 over here. Following this pooling layer, you'll have a second convolution layer, which is going to have a different set of maybe K3 filters. Each filter is going to have some face size L3 cross L3. So the convolution with these K3 filters is going to produce K3 uh, output channels. Now these filters, filter sizes are going to be, the face is L3 cross L3, but the depth is going to be K2. So each filter is going to be K2 cross L3 cross L3. Right? That's the size of this filter. And each filter is going to produce one map. So one ch channel. So if you have K3 of these filters, you're going to get K3 output channels for this layer. And so the parameters to choose for the second convolutional layer is going to be how many filters, which is K3, the size of the face, which is L3, and the stride with which this filter is going to pop forward over here plus this one, which is for the bias. So the total number of parameters is going to be, again, each filter is K2 L3 squared, right? So, and there are K3 filters. So you're going to be K3 times K2 L3 squared plus one. This is the total number of parameters for this convolutional layer. And then we have the next pooling layer. For max pooling, again, at each position, you're going to find the index of the largest value. Uh, it's uh, not, ask me that question in a couple of minutes. Okay, let me get through this. That's a good question. So uh, again, we'll have the next pooling layer. And for the max pooling, again, at each position, you're going to find the index of the largest value and then copy its value into the pool map. And the parameters to choose here again are the size of the pooling block and the stride. And so the sequence of pooling and downsampling will continue for several layers until the final layer output is flattened and fed to a softmax or an MLP. So in general, unless we want the convolutions themselves to shrink the maps, convolutions will be performed with a stride of one. So each convolution layer approximately maintains the size of the input. Now this, we will usually increase the number of maps at each convolution layer. What this means is that we will usually have more output channels than input channels in each convolution layer. And this is particularly relevant if we have downsampling layers. Downsampling with a stride greater than one loses information. So to compensate for it, we must increase the number of channels in the layer for downsampling. 
so that the net number of values we compute from the input remains large enough that we can expect all the useful input about the information about the input to be retained. And the filter sizes, their width, height, and strides, they can all vary within a layer, but uh, within a layer, they will generally all have the same size, size and stride, both for convolutions and for pooling. So here are the final set of parameters that are design choices. The number of convolution and downsampling layers, and for each convolution layer, the number of filters and the size of the filter and the stride. For each pooling layer, the size of the block and the stride. And then for the final MLP, how many layers and how many neurons in each layer. There is a, a hole over here. We'll skip the hole because they're out of time, right? So this figure shows the choices that Jan Lekun, actually, yeah, why not? Let's skip this. Do we need to show the pool? Uh, actually show it, right? Show the pool. Okay, okay. Guys. Ten seconds, guys. All right, let me stop this. They are the same, right? If you have been paying attention, uh, when uh, uh, each when you when you're when you have a scanning MLP, each neuron in the corresponding layer of the scanning scanning MLP produces a map. So uh, the the uh, which is a channel. So the number of channels in the output of a convolution layer is the same as the number of neurons in the corresponding layer of the scanning NLP. Uh, Professor Justin raised his hand. Yeah, I, okay, what's the question, Justin? Oh, hi, I just wanted to confirm what downsampling was. Uh, you said it was greater than strat equals to one, but if you use a strat equals to one, yeah. uh, you still get a smaller output. So it must not be that you just get a smaller output. What's like the formal, the definition we're going with is just greater than one stride? The definition of the definition literally. So imagine again, uh, ignoring edge FX is what I said, right? So assume that you're always zero padding such that if you are striding with one, you maintain size. Oh, okay. So, okay, right. gotcha. Right, so, so you, kind of, you won't be considering edge FX. So whatever the input and filter is, you scale it to be uh, the proper zero padded region. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Right, so, so I'm gonna go about five minutes over, guys, you're gonna have to bear with me, right? So this figure shows the choices Jan Lekun made for Lenet applied to digit classification in its original box. So the inputs were 32 cross 32. The first layer had uh, four filters of five cross five, no zero padding. So the output size reduces to 28 cross 28. Then he had a pooling filter, uh, which used two cross two max pooling. Then he had 12 convolution filters of size five cross five cross four. Again, no zero padding, so the output size reduces to 10 cross 10. Then a two cross two max pooling filter. And then he flattened it and put it through an NLP. So uh, this was actually one of the more powerful CNNs of the day. Now, We've described the network, but how do you train it? Recall that the CNN is just a large shared parameter NLP. So training is just like an NLP. The only difference is in the structure of the network. You're going to provide training examples consisting of inputs and labels, which for images would be images in their class. We define a divergence between uh, the desired output and the true out output of the network in response to any input. And then the network parameters are through gradient descent and the gradients are computed using back propagation. Now the parameters to learn are the weights of this final MLP and the weights and biases for every filter of 
every convolutional layer. So here we learn the weights for the NLP here and all of these filters, these guys, right? Now first, uh, oh gosh, something is wrong with my machine, so it's very slow. So to do the actual training, we have to define the loss between the actual output of the net and the desired output. And as usual, we'll first define a divergence between the two. For classification tasks, this divergence is typically going to be a KL divergence. The rest of the problem is set up as usual. We have the usual training set of input and output pairs. We have the divergence between the actual and desired outputs for each instance. This is a function of the parameters of the net. So the overall, overall loss is the average of the divergences in the training set. This too is a function of the parameters of the net. And so here is going to be the gradient descent algorithm to train the CNN. We initialize all the weights and biases and iteratively just apply the usual gradient descent rule. The key component here is how do you compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the individual parameters of the network? Now, again, the loss is the average of divergences. So the derivative of the loss is the average of the derivatives of the divergences with respect to the parameters. So the term we want to compute is this one. How do you compute the derivative of the divergence between the actual and desired outputs of the network for any input with respect to the individual network parameters, which are basically the filter parameters. So we're going to use backdrop. For the final flat layers, backdrop is performed exactly as it was for conventional NLPs. In the process, it will give us both the derivatives with respect to the parameters of the NLP and the derivatives with respect to the input to the MLP. Now recall that the input to the MLP is just the, uh, the, the uh, final layer was just obtained by flattening the final layer of the, uh, the output of the final layer, final convolution layer. So this means you can sort of, you actually have the derivatives with respect to every uh, value output by the final convolution layer. So back propagation of the derivative uh, from the, so the rest of the back propagation simply back propagates the derivatives out here back through the network. And this is a bit tricky. This is more complex than the straight up NLPs because of all the parameter sharing. And we will also need some additional logic for down sampling and cooling layers. So how do we do this? We're going to see this in the next class. And so to summarize, at a high level, we've seen a high level view of how to compute derivatives of the divergence with respect to all intermediate outputs and every fee-free parameter. I've punted some of this derivation to the next lecture. And now, but then once you get these derivatives, you can embed them into gradient descent. And we'll get into the de details of that in the next class. So here's the story so far. The convolution neural network is a supervised version of, of a computational model of mammalian vision. It includes convolution layers comprising learned filters that scan the outputs of the previous layer, downsampling layers that operate over groups of outputs from the convol convolution layer to reduce network size, and the parameters of the network can be learned through regular backpropagation. So I'll stop right here. We'll start the recording and I'll take any questions.